Thank you for watching this week's sermon. We hope it was an encouragement to you. We'd love to see you in person sometime. Please visit us at our church on Sunday mornings at either 9 a.m. or 1030 at Southport Church. If you want to learn more about us, please visit our website at southportchurchonline.com. We hope you have a wonderful week. God bless you. morning and Jesus we just we do proclaim that we believe in you we trust you we know you you are so good to us God I thank you for the meeting of your saints your people your church God I thank you that we have this opportunity to gather freely in your name and to worship you God thank you for this time of worship God thank you for this day that we get to breathe in this free air Lord, we just trust you that we are building and living into the story that you've given us as your people, God. God, I just uh, continue to lift up everyone in our community this morning that's either in victory or in struggle. God, you are bigger than all of it. And I pray that we continue to write a narrative that proclaims that truth, God, and that we don't feel isolated in any way. We don't feel fragmented, but we feel together and joined together as we gather this morning, God. Thank you, Lord. We trust you. We love you. We thank you for this day. Lord, bless this sermon, God. May the word of God be truth. May it be water for our souls. May it build us up and empower us so that we can go out into this world and be transforming people. We love you, God, and we thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, worship team. Thank you so much, uh, everybody who's serving this morning. It's just good to be together. And um, as we are um, going into this kind of next step of our storytellers sermon, we're going to talk about fragments this morning, church. And fragments, you know what a fragment is, right? It's kind of like that broken piece, a broken pieces. I don't know if you've ever cracked a mirror before on the ground and just shatters into a million fragments all over the place. What a mess, my goodness. But um, they're isolated pieces is what we're talking about. And it's kind of like how an island is an isolated piece of land. It's not connected to the mainland, right? An island, um, they're separated from the rest and it doesn't experience kind of that natural um, connection with the rest of the land. The rest of the land, when it's connected, it has a, a, um, a to and fro in its ecosystems, but islands, they're kind of their own thing. <clears throat> they're their own ecosystem, they're, they're kind of their own climate, and, um, and they kind of generate kind of anomalies of species or different things like that. You'll see if you're watching a nature show when you're really bored and watch Netflix or something, but you see that. And um, sometimes we say that no person is an island. Um, and no one should leave themselves cut off and fragmented from other people, disconnected. Isolation as, as humans is usually connected to a response not of health, but of trauma or um, unmet needs that remain like a deficit or, or uh, underfilled in our human condition. Um, in the world, we want to go to islands, right? Especially on a day like today. We love a tropical climate, right? <laughs> islands, um, they're the right climate for peace and rest. There's usually a sweet smell of aroma of flowers when you arrive. And one can usually find a healthy sense of just well-being and rest. But if a person is an island to themselves, there usually isn't a warm climate, right? There, there typically is a lot of unrest, and I think the only peace that usually can be received is in forms of getting a piece of their mind if you cross them the wrong way. That's the only kind of peace you're going to get. Um, but what I want to preach about today is, this is the second to last of our, our Storyteller uh, series, is I want to talk about uh, how danger it is, dangerous it is for a believer of Jesus to be living and operating out of a, a fragmented narrative. And the fragmented story is what we're talking about. And um, God kind of led me on this kind of egg hunt of scripture. I don't know if you've ever done this where God just kind of opens things up to you and he gives you a, a one verse over here and another verse over there and you're going, God, why, why am I hearing this or sensing this? And, and so when I was preaching or preparing to write this sermon, a few different uh, sets of scriptures came to my mind and I, go, I went, God, I don't understand how these are connected. He's all just be ready to preach on it because I'm going to show you how they're connected. And so I'm like, okay, God, here we go. And so so, um, and so that's just kind of what we have to do and uh, to show how these uh, 
A few pieces of scripture are connected this morning as they're part of my story and our story and your story. And sometimes understanding the why of God comes after the obedience. Amen? Amen. And I think this applies to life. It seems like life is best understood backwards, but only can be lived in the, fro- in the forward direction. It's interesting how that is. And sometimes it's the same when you follow God. He first calls you to obey, and then you can understand why. So, this morning we're going to dive into Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. It's probably something you're familiar with if you've been in the church for a while. Solomon, King Solomon is talking about this as he's dispensing wisdom. He said out of verse 9, Two are better than one, because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, then one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. And God is pretty good because this morning I met with uh, our men of the church and we gathered for the first time and we had 10 guys show up and we prayed together this morning and one of the things that were talked about, yeah, we can clap about that, that's amazing. Men of the church gathering for prayer, that's a good thing. And one of the things that came up was about not being a single cord to be broken. And so it's just interesting, God's making connections all over the place. When uh, we are people who find ourselves in a fragmented narrative, uh, what we have begun to do is we started, we've begun to disassociate ourselves with others, disassociate. You know, an infant is capable of constructing deeply held beliefs about the self as a result of early encounters with others. So if this is true, that we are able to figure that out when we are babies of how we can perhaps understand that our deeply held beliefs about connection with other people um, is rooted in our experiences that we um, understand why we perhaps are easily connected to others or why we are um, at times have a struggle and we remain disconnected from one another. And this can give us a perspective that we either have a lot to be thankful for for our parents or we have a lot to forgive them for. <laughs> and, not, and not just parents, but family and, and people of authority, um, uh, our uh, early friendships, our first loves or our lost loves or whatever it is. In either case, the call for us as the people of God is to not remain disconnected to the larger truth that you and I are never meant to remain guarded in guarded states of suspicion, in guarded states without giving another human soul the opportunity to know us and to be known. And this isn't the wisdom of God or even the wisdom of Solomon to be fragmented. He has us here on verse 9, focus our attention that if we are to work together in harmony, the return is not a focus on fortunes, but on return of a blessing that we seek. For there is a lot to labor in this life, right? There's a lot to work through, to work on, to work for. And if we are bound by our created need to be associated with each other, created that way, then we see that in this adversity of life, we have more of a return if we are working in like-mindedness against adversity. Yet, what do we find ourselves convinced is the best route as we live in this day and age? We are highly entrenched, involved all the time, driving on the highway, on a TV commercial. We are seeing that the I, the individual, is elevated more than a family unit or or a, 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 a village or a church body. We live in this I generation, right? And I believe there is a greater return in our society if there is stability in our families 
in our people groups, in our, in our connections with one another. Pastor Michael and Edie talked about this in Belize of, of one of some of the efforts and, and I don't want to take away from what they experienced but what they shared with us is that some of the efforts down there is to stabilize the connections of families so that it stabilizes the government and so on and so on and I would say this isn't just a Central America idea it's, it's a worldwide thing that if we are disassociated from one another there's a lack of stability in our society. If, if we are isolated from one another in a church, there's a lack of stability in the people of God. We become ineffective. So, verse 10 challenges us to see that there is a mutual benefit. For in the life we do need to lay down ourselves to bear with one another what comes along. We are exposed to the elements of life that does require the need for the warmth of a human, human connection that enriches our narrative to help us endure and thrive. We need that. And we see this lying down as a form of vulnerability with one another. When you see lying down, think of vulnerability. How vulnerable are you with other people? Are you vulnerable with the right people or the wrong people, right? And in the bonds that should be the character marks of the people of God, we lay down our defenses and reside with the other in an understanding that this mutual space of being vulnerable and being known between one another, we receive the needs that come, that come along in the calling of the doing this journey together, that we are able to find and meet those needs. See, God enables us to demonstrate the blessings of his kingdom by the provision through his people. He uses us. And this cannot take shape if we are disassociated with each other or unable to resemble the Lord we claim to follow and model. Do you follow and model? Or do you just try to model? And we live in an age where the stating, if we state that we're evangelical out to the world, it means that we just gave away some kind of political preference, right? That's, that's kind of the known idea. If you say you're an evangelical Christian, it's a political statement now rather than a, a spiritual statement. And so we have a lot of work to do to better resemble the community that is vulnerable, that is authentic, and that is approachable. This last Tuesday, a good number of us uh, went to Lenise's Cafe. Uh, Pastor Michael calls it Lindsay Cafe. It's Lenise. We'll, we'll keep working on that. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> And we, sh we shared stories, we asked questions, uh, and noted that one thing that we appreciate about our church is that the journey that we have walked together, especially in this last year, recent months, uh, people have had to lay down their vulnerability before the church to see if it was going to do what it's created to do. And, and if we would be willing to extend ourselves to one another in our community. And if we would not be willing to extend ourselves, our, our, the warmth and the affection and the commitment to serve our neighbor, then many in our community, I know, would not be experiencing the connection of God through our uh, obedience. God has used us, and God will continue to use this if we are willing to allow people and to be approachable to lay down what they need before the church, before the people of God. Not that we are elevating ourselves, but what we are is we're actually seeing that we're about God's business. We're about the gospel. That people come through our doors or people may approach you out of the blue because there's something spiritual about you. There's something distinct about you. There's something within the, the spirit that you are already, that goes before you that they know they need. So are people able to be vulnerable and connected with you? Think of how ineffective we as the church would be if we didn't respond to the world that is riddled with pain and shame and grief because we prefer, we prefer just to be islands. There are a lot of churches that are islands right now. They're entrenched, they're click, they're, they focus inward. They're a bunch of holy huddles, right? Look at us. You're in my seat, you're in my parking spot, this new person, what are you doing, you know? That's not us. That's not our story. We assumed, if we assumed this fragmented story as a Christian, we would see ourselves, we'd be no different than the rest of the world. Dog eat dog, you know, trying to be king of the mountain. 
And when the state of the world does blow over the soul of another human being in a, in a frigid wind, it only produces more islands of pain and being an enemy to God. If we promote the idea in others that they are better off to bear it on their own. And instead of being consistent people who they can trust that complements the claim to be full of love of God, can the faith you identify with be backed up by evidence others testify to? You say you love the Lord, but is there evidence? Is there a witness in your life? I had a, uh, Justin and I have a friend named Lamar. He said, if you claim that you're a Christian, is there enough evidence to convict you that you're guilty of that? That's a good question. I got to think about that. Is there enough evidence? Or is it just an empty claim without a witness? Because we're looking to find and we're looking to see that we need to have witnesses in our walk. The final portion of Solomon's words here are to see that when we all are at times have threats that come in on us that try to overpower us. And when we do that, one person is easily taken down. Yet, the presence of two or three produces a strength that can otherwise be known. As a youth intern, I recall this one winter, I think it was a February weekend like this, where there was snow on the mountain, and there was about 40 to 45 students in a, a young life cabin up in, Truc up in Truckee, and um, boredom set in, and suddenly about seven high school guys decided they were going to take me down, and I wrestled them for about an hour straight, okay? And they were unsuccessful in taking me down for about 45 minutes, okay? And the rest of the staff and other kids were just kind of go, well, yeah, this looks entertaining. Let's, let's see what happens. Let's see how much furniture they can break, right? <laughs> and and it, was, it was, I don't say that to puff up like, yeah, I, over, I overcame a bunch of high schoolers. You know, I'm not saying that to you. But, but what I saw and when I reflect back is that at first, they would just kind of come at me randomly. And... I just throw them off or push them over, whatever, you know, in a loving, Christ-like way. <laughs> and, but after about 25 minutes or so, they started to do something. They started to strategize, right? They started to communicate with one another. They started to say, okay, you take his legs, I'll jump on his back, and, you know, and, and, and then, and so what, I remember this one moment when they finally took me down, and it was a big success for them, you know, and it was just, I was so exhausted, but, but it was neat to see, <clears throat> it was because they just joined together that they strategized to take down, you know, to them, this Goliath, you know, and it was good entertainment, but it was interesting to see what it took for them to come together and not be overtaken any longer. They, they needed each other. And it's kind of a silly little example, but we need such cooperation in the large obstacles of life that come our way, Right? We need to band together to take down those Goliaths in our life. Even if they're just emotional mountains or Goliaths. We have to risk trusting one another to participate in the areas that we are struggling in so that we're not easily overtaken. And that's where none of us are immune to that. And we do this because we, we know that the devil is a liar, right? And sometimes if we don't have other voices of support and influence and health and that are connected to the word or that are spirit bound or spirit focused, then we can start listening to those whispers and those lies in the dark, right? And we can start to get twisted up and influence and, and we can start to see that it can overpower us. It can overtake us. No one should be an island. And if we are denying connection with each other, or isolating ourselves from God, we need to accept that all of us are susceptible to influences that are not wise and that we can be overtaken in our good judgment at times. We can have a lapse in it. We can have seasons where we're stuck in sin. And, and, the, and the, the natural thing is to want to isolate and hide it, right? But that is the exact opposite thing that we as the people of God should be doing. We should bring it to the light. We should not be islands. We can be a peninsula every once in a while. We'll accept that. That's fine. You could be Baja. That's okay. Right? You could be Florida. That's fine. But I want you to be Kansas right in the middle of it all. Right? And I so want the people of God to band together as a force of fellowship that wrestles down and tackles lies with freedom bound in the truth of God. 
And it's okay if you don't have all the answers to solve the problems of the, the questions that people come at you with. It's okay. What you need to do is you need to be encouraged to go to the Word of God to make sure that you are asking the right questions of your life. And so many people remain isolated because they're only asking what the self wants. And the self gets pretty twisted up. They say in all the Disney films, just follow your heart. I'm not following my heart. My heart is fickle. My heart is twisted up. My heart doesn't know what it wants. One day it wants non-fat. The other day it wears, you know, where's the pizza? I can't wait, you know. <laughs> but we should remain isolated. We shouldn't deny the community that we're made to be in and connected with. And we shouldn't settle in this community of God's people for superficial kind of followers that build you up with thumbs ups and retweets and hearts on Instagram. No, no, no. We need real commitment. We need real connection. You see, the person who is able to see the world as God created it, it is given a worldview through scripture. And we should allow scripture to remain that source of authority because there are people who love God, who follow Jesus, but they got other th authorities that they're listening to. And what do they do when those two authorities come head to head? When we have a worldview that's, that's built up in scripture, this provides the means to appropriately live a life knowing further and further what is good and what gives glory. Do you know what gives good in your life and what, what gives God glory? Or is it a little hazy, hazy right now? And I hope in your hearts today that there is an ever-increasing hunger in your life that seeks the good to give God glory. What I want you to do is I want you to say to your neighbor right now, say, seek the good to give the glory. Seek the good to give the glory. It's okay if you're by yourself. Tell it to yourself. That's okay. <laughs> see, I want to I see the ministry of support and care not just originate from the leaders in the, or the pulpit of this church. I want it to be amongst all of us. To see that all of you are enabled to see the multitude of return if you keep progressing in your way of discipleship that we are a, to be a blessing to others as we walk this journey in step with each other. And sometimes you lag behind and sometimes some of you run ahead, but we got to remain connected. We got to be tethered. We got to see that connection. We got to, we got, sometimes people will stray off and we got to pull them in in a loving way. Sometimes we stray off, we got to, we got to route back through the loving calls of our neighbors and our friends and our community of God here. Seeking the good of one another and giving God the glory through such actions of faith and obedience. But there are those we need to disassociate ourselves with. Certain people who are a threat to our good and God's glory. Now, they are all loved by God. Let me make that clear. They are all loved by God. But we can love them by giving ourselves and them a certain amount of defendable space for our good. When, when I was a kid, I was a, you know, my dad was a firefighter, and so he would always bring home Smokey the Bear and Woodsy the Owl posters and bumper stickers and t-shirts and stuff, and I remember this one it had this question on it, do you have enough defendable space? 80 feet around your house, right? And I thought about that, like, that's so far. And my dad would say, no, it's not. You need, sometimes you need a bigger defendable space, depending on how hot the fire is, right? And, and so I asked that question, do you have defendable space in your life that protects and shields the good in your life and God's glory? Because sometimes you're not able to overcome some of the stuff that comes at us. And this might fit, th these per people might fit this, this scenario, and I don't want to say category because I don't want us to be people that categorize other, one another, right? If we start categorizing one another, then I don't know about you, but when I've been categorized, it's been really hurtful. And sometimes when you categorize people, you just go, they're in this box and I'm going to write them off, right? Because I have to say, and I have to ask, isn't, isn't every human heart able to be redeemed by the power of God? And sometimes it's not going to come through you, and sometimes you do need that defendable space. It's okay. God's will and God's love and God's care is bigger than your reality between you and that other person. God may bring another person in their life 
to help correct them, heal them, shield them, and whatnot. But they at this time, or historically, were these people, if they perhaps seeing you in a fallen place, or on your backside, or in a place of distress, don't offer a hand of help, but were hurtful. So I wonder, do we offer a hand to hurt and not help? Or do we offer a hand to help and not hurt? And if they condemned you first and loved you second, if the word of God was slapped across your teeth instead of being fed to your weakened mind for nourishment, if they gave you guilt instead of giving God gratitude for being chosen in that time to offer you a hand, I think we always should be more ready to jump in than to judge. We should be ready to jump in than to judge. And when God calls you to be empowered to offer help, it doesn't mean that we accept the folly and choices that God isn't pleased with in them. We, aren't, we ain't the judge. But it also doesn't mean that we're off the hook if God calls you to be the one to offer the help. Perhaps all the areas you have traveled through in this life have prepared you to be able. And the question is, you may be able, but are you available? And does someone who lives in a fragmented narrative because maybe we push them away with shame through the truth? Or are you available to be the bridge between folly and faith? So sometimes there's people that we got to kind of have that defendable space, but then there's other people that we recognize God has walked us through some stuff to be able to be uh, caring for them. So are we available for that? It's pretty funny, this last, or two weeks ago, little Ava, our youngest daughter, she came up to Jessica and she wanted to know the verses about love in the Bible. Oh, how sweet, precious child. Why do you want to know those verses? Well, I want to know those verses because my sister's been mean to me and I want to make her know that she is in the wrong and I'm going to use the Bible. We're like, whoa, hang on, Kyle. hang on, hang on, child. I love that spirit. <laughs> but we don't use the truth to bring that judgment on each other, right? We use it to build a way that pleases God and creates a relationship with him and each other. And that's exactly what a priest is. A bridge, a path, a way back to God. May we be available for others' good and God's glory. You and I are called to be a royal priesthood, right? A holy nation. We are to be bridge builders. Those people who are stuck on islands of, of hurt and, and shame and guilt. I know you're able, but are you available this morning? Second, you may know or be this person if you do, do not provide the needs for others and you turn your back on them. So do you supply or exhaust the need? Do you supply or fill the need or do you exhaust the need? Solomon says, when vulnerability exists between people who offer what they have, they are kept warm. And when we turn our back on one another, we block the very provision that God bless you with to ensure the needs of others are taken care of. Let me extend beyond the material reality for, for uh, your life or the ministry of Southport Church because we can easily see that we didn't make budget for the second month in a row last, last month. And we could lose heart. Yeah, we could. And if you've been faithful to God in all areas, thank you for seeking the good for others and God's glory. And why, you know, and we're doing everything we can to stretch every gift this month. But we put a pie chart on there to show you that as a disciple, or as a leadership team, the board and ministry leaders, this is what it takes to do the minimum around here, okay? But it isn't going to work if God's people aren't aware and responsive to God's lead. So I trust God will provide. I trust God will speak to hearts of Southport Church and let them know if they are part of ensuring that the needs to be met are going to be taken care of by remaining consistent or if it is, he's looking for a new act of giving from some of us today. And all I can do is make you aware. I'm not going to judge. I'm just going to love. I'm just going to love you. 
you know, we were unexpectedly tight after a year of abundance, okay? So all I can do is ask you to pray if this is an area of new commitment for you. Pray that God gives us wisdom and provision. And all I can do is share the need for the ministry we are committed to. But I trust that if God is leading us in this direction, there is going to be ups and downs, but God is going to be faithful. I trust that. And all we need to do is remain faithful to him. And I trust you, church. I trust that God is in control. And I'm not worried. And taking this beyond all forms of giving, because I believe that giving is a fruit of devotion, not at the heart of it. That we give ourselves in every way to other people because it's a fruit of what God has done to us in our hearts. And if we are to see real connection that commits, that shows up, that answers the call from the pulpit or from a desperate call in the middle of the night, we need to lay down our walls, our guard, our agendas, and see that the most enriched part of life is when we can bear together, giving praise to God, that we can meet every need because we no longer are being satisfied with being islands with each other. We want to be connected. That's the kind of church I want to be a part of. That's the kind of connections I want to see amongst ourselves. Do you see that? Maybe you don't realize that you are already the answer to prayers that people are praying in our community for right now. You. You may be able, but are you available? When marriages are strained, when children feel lost, when careers are in between, when health is fragile, when we need vulnerability of one another to lay down our very lives so that every need is met. That's what we see in Acts 2. The early church, they shared everything and they praised God for it. And every need was met. And God often places us in the right opportunity to extend his provision from him and reach its full purpose when it is received to, to he who calls us to extend it to the final image that Solomon brings to mind is that if we know or have been a person that seeks to overpower, then there is another healthy reason for a defendable space. Because we need to ask ourselves, do we defend or do we defeat in this life? Do we defend or do we defeat? And what we should find in our story, if it is to progress into that fully developed drama of overcoming every arrow slung at us, is to have people in our lives that protect, people in our lives that defend, and people that safeguard us with wisdom. Not rooted in their dysfunction or fragmented ideas, but planted solid on the word of God. And we must realize that we can only result in fragmented stories if we don't feel protected. If we don't, if we aren't built up to overtake the threats in this life. Many people from these places of insecurity shut off or shut down from one another. They're closed off to God for all they can ever receive are messages that prove that it is better if they remain unattached and unavailable for God because God sometimes is too scary with the kind of vulnerability that he asks of us from him and to be with one another. Because we're worried that that is going to overpower us and the result is going to be some kind of bankruptcy or some kind of broken heart. But that isn't the truth. If only we could see that and reinforce in community that God, by the Holy Spirit, infuses into us his very character to meet the needs that this community has, that you have in your life, that you have in your family, that you have in your marriage, that you have in the seeking of what is next, Lord. It's amongst us, the ability to be reinforced and encouraged. And we risk in such a way because God calls us to be a covenantal people, not contractual people. Contractual people is like, what? You messed up? We're done. I'm writing you off. I tear up the contract. Don't ever come over to my house again. Don't ever provide coffee, you know. I'm not eating those donuts anymore, you know. No, we're covenantal. We're committed. We forgive and forget. And we build, seek to build each other up and watch God build in us new things we never expected. You are invited into that same journey to walk together, to travel the road of life together. Solomon uses the one, then the two, and finishes with the three 
as a writing tool that demonstrates that what these practices ensure in us and our lives is fullness and completion. Like a cord that is not easily broken, we see in a rope the exact opposite of isolation. We see integration. You look at a, a, a rope, right? It's all woven in together. We are called to be woven in together and connected. When we bind our lives to Christ and with one another, we, we see a full measure of return for our work because the name of Jesus has power. Amen? Amen. And it does not return void. We risk defending the cause of justice wherever it shows up. It may be easy to see in the mission fields of Central America, but injustice, victimization, and cruelty is happening in the lives of our brothers and sisters all the time right now. We're able to help, but are we available for their good and God's glory? Are you willing to not allow them or yourselves to live in the narrative of isolation? So I challenge you, church, to ask God, what if I rejected the fragmented story? What if I risked asking for help if I have fallen down? What if I extended my provision to another that could be God's purpose for it? What if I advocated for the marginalized and the victimized and the orphaned in my view? And if you don't see any in your view, then you know what you got to do. You got to ask God to give you eyes to see his view because they're present. It's very real. And so we have to ask God, give me a view to see as you see. Lord, who am I to protect, extend, and to lift up in this life? That should be our call. That should be our story. Then you stand and observe and then partake because the Christian life is not a life that sits on the sidelines. It gets in the field. It gets in the games. It goes all the way to the end of the fourth quarter. It's not giving up until it's done. We start strong and we end strong. And the only way we can do that is if we do it together. You were given new life and new purpose. Bind your story with God and the rest of his people. Be brave enough to be known for all parts of your story. I repeat, all parts of your story. Well, that's scary. I know it's scary. But we all got those parts of our story. We ain't fooling anybody. So we have to be known and to know one another. As I prepare for communion this morning, I was led to that other scripture about the road to Emmaus in Luke 24. After Jesus' resurrection, the two companions were on the road and they met another. We know it's Christ. They don't know it's Christ, right? And although they couldn't perceive it was him, they found themselves traveling in a party of three. I love seeing that echo there from Ecclesiastes. There's three of them there, and they were complete because they were with the Lord. And for it was only in the moment after they begged him to, to stay with them and go and eat, it was only in the moment that Christ broke bread at the meal in their, in their presence that their eyes were opened to the very presence of Christ with them. And not only this, they realized at that moment that Jesus was with them all along on that journey. And I firmly believe that when two or more are gathered in his name, Christ is present. And sometimes it takes a willingness to be broken and vulnerable with others and God for Christ, broken like Christ was, for us to see clearly how his presence and love for us has been with us all along even when we have felt isolated and fragmented. My encouragement to you today is to let the glory of God be your good. Instead of living on your own little Tom Hanks talking to a volleyball island, we don't want that. We reject that narrative. Let his sacrifice be the power that overcame death of sin to be the force that brings you into deeper fellowship to the others and to our heavenly father. And may that process of becoming less and less isolated and further and further integrated be the most dynamic part of your story. Because we see that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he knew those who would deny him. He knew those who would betray him. He knew the pain that was in front of him. But still he chose 
to do wasn't good for his body, but it was for God's glory and it was for our good. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was in the upper room with his disciples. And he, as they were celebrating Passover, broke the bread and said, take this and eat, for this is my body broken for you. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks to God and he gave it to them and said, drink this, for this is a symbol of a new covenant sealed in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And as often as we partake of this meal, drink of this cup and eat of this bread, we are proclaiming that we are united with Christ. And we are proclaiming that until he returns again. That our narrative is not fragmented and isolated, it's very connected. And it's very purposeful. That God has an abundance for you and it's full of life. Let us pray as we prepare our hearts to partake of this meal and if the ushers could come forward. Jesus, we thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for the narrative that is of you and we reject the isolated narrative. We do want to be connected to you and to one another. We don't want to be overtaken. We don't want to be left isolated. We want to be known and vulnerable. We will risk that with you, God. Know our hearts, know our pain, know our joys, know our fears, and wash it all with the blood. May it be consecrated to you, God. We love you, God. I thank you for this meal. I thank you for your sacrifice. I thank you for all that you are doing and you will do because it is for our good and it's for your glory. Merciful Father, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. People of God, come and partake the meal of God. In the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was broken for you, partake of this and do this in remembrance of him. The cup which symbolizes the crucifixion of our Lord Drink this in assurance of full pardon and grace. Do this in remembrance of our Lord. Let us pray. God, we thank you for these elements. Lord, we thank you for this morning. God, I pray that we go in peace and we're empowered to live a story that is founded in this truth. That where we are made to be broken before you, God, so that we can be made whole through your sacrifice, Jesus. May we be able and available for your purposes. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, church. Bless you this week. Go and make new disciples.